Now, from one physician to another, I am thrilled to share that we have Dr. Clayton, an internationally recognized leader in many fields. Uh, Dr. Clayton is a Craig Weaver Professor of Pediatrics Law and Health Policy at Vanderbilt University. She is currently co-chair of the Report Review Committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and in that role has overseen most of uh, their reports on COVID-19. Dr. Clayton, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to have you here. Oh, well, I am really pleased to be here. And I just, I have to say it, I love your purple blazer and your purple glasses. They match and <laughs> I think it's fabulous. <laughs> well, you know, you got to do something to, uh, you know, to make you make yourself smile. Yes, I couldn't agree more. That's why I'm wearing my, I said this morning, I'm wearing my sparkle uh, or my glam, my vaccine glam for, we're going to, you know, talk about the vaccine today. <laughs> right, there you go. Uh, all right, so let's jump right in. Um, you have a really deep and impressive expertise in research ethics and safety. And so I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on the COVID-19 vaccines and their safety profiles. I think actually extraordinary care has been taken to do this. And even though it's been on an accelerated uh, path, nonetheless, the companies that have been involved have really worked very hard to meet uh, regulatory and ethical standards. I think one of the reasons it seems so fast is that usually when you do a, a drug or a vaccine, you do an early trial to see if it's safe and then a smaller trial to see, another trial to see if it's effective and then a big trial to, to test both those things. What they did here was sort of do them all together. And so, um, so what would ordinarily have been a one or two year process, they were able to do much more quickly. And it's been, you know, really, it's been very impressive. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And uh, that's very much in line with what Dr. Ruth from the CDC was saying, um, you know, that it happened quickly, but there was still so much um, thought put into and consideration put into ensuring that these are safe. Um, so the first two approved vaccines by Moderna and Pfizer are 95% effective. Uh, but the most recently or soon to be approved vaccine J&J &J, is only about 70% effective. So what are your thoughts on this? Because people are wondering, is it still worth getting or should I wait until I can get the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine? What's the thought there? You should get any vaccine you should get um, or you can get. If someone will put it in your arm, do it. But I think one of the things that we need to be clear about is that first of all, the J&J &J vaccine, the 70% efficacy is against pre uh, preventing all disease. It's actually much more effective for preventing se severe disease or death. So it's actually quite effective in that regard. And frankly, the uh, efficacy of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are quite uncommon um, in vaccine history. So to, to think about it, the comparison is flu vaccine which from year to year is often only about 50% effective. So, so the J&J &J vaccine is actually quite effective and it's really effective against the bad things, against being on a ventilator or dying. And so I would say, you know, if you can get it, I would get it uh, because it's a whole lot better than getting COVID, uh, a whole lot better than getting COVID. So, I, so I totally endorse that. Um, it may be possible to do a, J&J uh, &J is doing a trial to see if a booster will increase efficacy. Um, that'll be interesting to see. But right now, just on the basis of what we have, if you can get the J&J &J vaccine, you should get it. I love it. So get whatever vaccine is offered to you. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. Uh, so that leads me, you know, we're talking about vaccinations, people, um, you know, eventually we, we want to get to this critical point where what we're hearing, it's called herd immunity. We're hearing it all over the news everywhere. People are, it's a big buzzword these days. Um, so could you tell us more about what exactly herd immunity means and what would need to happen for us to be able to achieve it? Sure. Um, one of the reasons that COVID is spreading so rapidly right now is that it's actually a pretty effective spreader and most people aren't immune. 
So if I have it, then if I run into somebody else who isn't immune, they can get it. But if everybody I see already is already immune, I can have the disease, I can be very contagious, but the fact of the matter is no one else will get it because everybody else is already immune. So that's what herd immunity is. And the amount, level of herd immunity you have to have is directly correlated with how infectious it is. The most infectious disease we know of right now is measles. Um, and measles is extremely infectious. And so that's the reason. So to get herd immunity for something like measles, you have to have 95% of the population has to be immune. That's extraordinarily high. Um, for COVID, uh, it's less infectious than that. So the projections right now are 70 or 80%. But here's an important point. Some of these new variants that are coming around, like the one from the UK and the one from South Africa, are actually more infectious than the ones we have here now. And so, uh, so what we really want to do is get as many people uh, immunized right now and to get the herd immunity as high as they can to slow down all the COVID. And so, and so to prevent us from still getting really pretty good herd immunity if 70 or 80% of people are immune and to prevent the really more infectious ones from getting widespread. So then we have to have herd immunity at a much higher level. So it all turns on whether the people who you are, who you are exposed to or whom you expose are immune and how infectious it is. But if everybody around you is immune, you can't spread it. That's what we want. That was a great explanation. I, I've been hearing it so much. And so it was good to hear you put it into context. And 70 to 80% people, we've got to get out there and get those shots in arms and get vaccinated. <laughs> Take whichever one they give you, right? right. <laughs> um, so you're also a pediatrician. On the long list of, of job titles you have, which is very impressive, you are a pediatrician. Um, and so what information do you want um, children and their parents, um, especially children living with autoimmune diseases, to know about the COVID-19 vaccine? So the thing I want to say about that is that we haven't started testing the vaccines in children. Um, that is common um, that we wait to do kids until we do adults. But but it's important for the parents of those children to get immunized because we realize that those children might be more susceptible to COVID and they might be more likely to have adverse side effects. And so the people who are caring for these kids um, ought to get immunized themselves. And in fact, some states like ours um, are really reaching out to parents who have um, uh, children who are seriously ill to make sure that they get the vaccine so that they don't make the kids sick because the kids themselves can't get it, but certainly the adults can. And if they have, have the opportunity, they should. Yeah, yeah. That's great insight. And I think there hasn't been a whole lot of conversation happening that I've seen surrounding um, the vaccine and kids or there's there haven't been a lot of people able to answer questions. So thank you for, for speaking to that. Uh, so we have been taking questions um, that came in as folks registered for the webcast, and I wanted to actually call out one in particular um, that somebody wrote in, and, and they shared, um, my fiance and I both work on the front lines, but we're nervous to get the COVID, COVID vaccine since we want to start a family soon. What do you recommend? Do it. Do um, it. <laughs> so, I, I mean, that's sort of silly, but I want to say there are a couple things to say there. I mean, first of all, um, there is some misinformation going around saying that the vaccine may affect fertility. Um, to my knowledge, there is no evidence of that whatsoever, either in humans or in animal models, and, or any reason to think that's the case. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing to say is that increasingly, uh, the recommendations are coming out that even that even pregnant women who also are a group who tend not to be in trials early on, the recommendations are coming out saying, if you are pregnant and if you have the chance to get the vaccine, that you should talk about it with your doctor um, because it may be safe and effective. We don't have the data yet. 
There's even some early evidence coming out that if a woman gets um, uh, gets the vaccine, that she will pass on some immunity to um, to her unborn child. So you know we are moving quickly here, and you know, and we don't always have the data that we absolutely want. But there's no reason to think that if you are a healthy young adult and you are, you know, and you have access to the vaccine because you're um, a healthcare provider, um, just do it. I mean, it's um, it will uh, it will protect you, and it will also if you become. It's there's also evidence that if you become pregnant and you have and you're and you get infected, that it leads to adverse birth outcomes, prematurity, and more healthcare problems for the woman. So again, I would just say that that on balance, it's pretty clear that if you are a healthy young adult working on the front line, you are at risk of getting this infection. And particularly um, if you're planning to get pregnant sometime soon, you better get it now. I mean, you may be able to get it also when you're pregnant, but there's less data about, fewer data about that. But boy, I would get it I would get it right now. Well, that's so helpful, uh, Dr. Clayton. Uh, we really appreciate that. And for those of you who do, if you are pregnant and you do decide to get the vaccine, uh, you know, do look for those registries out there. We've been talking about that with Dr. Ruth and Dr. Medlubian, that it is so valuable to um, share your data and to, so that we can begin to track this and we can begin to understand, um, you know, the vaccine within different populations. And so again, you can really make an impact there. So we, we definitely encourage you to do that. Dr. Clayton, you are fabulous and we are so lucky um, to have had you on our newscast today. Thank you for sharing uh, your wisdom and your insight uh, and with, with our community. We are so grateful for um, all that you shared today. Well, I can't tell you, I mean, I love doing this stuff and I'm so happy to share information. And if it saves even one person from getting this awful infection, then that is time well spent. <laughs>